Okay, so picking up at line 1606. Okay, Beowulf has killed Grindel's mother already. And then he takes the sword and he finds Grindel and he lops off Grindel's head. And that's when we get, you know, all the blood welling up above the water and line 1600, the ninth hour came, etc. Notice the noble shieldings abandon the headland. How noble is that, you know? To leave the guy alone. The guests, that is Beowulf's men, sit sick at heart. They don't think there's any help. Then the sword began, that blade, to waste away into battle icicles from the war blood. It was a great wonder that it melted entirely, just like ice when the father loosens the frost fetters, blah, 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 blah. So Beowulf chops off Grindel's head, and then the sword starts to melt in front of his very eyes. And he watches it melt. <coughs> So then Beowulf leaves the mirror. Notice we're told he took no more precious treasures from that place, though he saw a lot, than the head and the hilt. Okay? So he's holding in one hand Grindel's head, and he either has in the other hand the sword hilt, or he sticks it in his belt. But now he's got to go from the bottom of the mirror to the top of the water. How long did it take to get from here to here? Quil dais. Whatever that means. A while of the day. A long time, in other words. So now he's got to go upwards. And he dove up through the water. And notice, line 1620. The sea currents were entirely cleansed. Now, it's not exactly clear how that means that. Um... He drove up through the water, line 1620, where in Eve that is, the waters of the of the mirror were purged. Okay. Are they cleansed as Beowulf makes his way up through it? We don't know. What do we have an image of? Baptism. Baptism. Okay. He goes down in the water. They think he dies, and he comes back up through the water, and the water is cleansed, and the water is cleansing, all right? So, da, 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 da. the sea currents were entirely cleansed, the spacious regions, when that alien spirit gave up life days, and this loaned world, this Lana world. So when Grendel dies, it's like the water suddenly turns pure. The defender of seafarers came to land, warm, stout-hearted, rejoiced in his sea booty, a great burden which he brought with him. His men see him, and they're all overjoyed. They're thrilled. They rejoice in their prince. They thank God that they could see him safe and sound. And from him they take his helmet and his coat of mail. Okay. They go for it, they follow the trail back, rejoicing in their hearts, and they make their way to Kara. <clears throat> How big is Grindel's head? So they, two men, two pairs of men. they carried the head from the sea cliff with great trouble, <coughs> even for two pairs of stout hearted men. Okay. Beowulf carried the head by himself, swimming up against the water to get back to the top. But it takes four of his men in even that with difficulty to carry the head. Now, I always like to think of logistics and things. How do they carry the head? Is it like, you know, one on this side, like carrying a casket, one on this side, one on this side, one over here, one over here, and they've each grabbed a shank of hair? So what do they do? This is probably what they do. I'm assuming he's not very, you know, physically uh, appealing looking. They probably have their spears stuck like that somehow. 
And they're each carrying so that one's kind of in the front, you know, sticking out this way, and one's kind of in the back, sticking out this way. So you have one guy like this, and the guy up ahead of him like this. So how big is the head? The head's got to be huge. Okay, so then you put a body to the head. How big is the head? He's not eight feet tall, in other words. He's not 10 feet tall. If his head is, you know, this big around, so that it takes four men to carry, he's probably, what, 20, 30 feet tall? In other words, okay? So what do they do? They make their way on a battle pole, they're carrying Grindel's head, until presently 14 proud and battle-hardy gates came to the hall. 14 battle-hardy? What did the other 13 do? They stood and watched. They didn't, actually didn't even watch. They stood at the edge of the water and waited. <laughs> Is he coming back? Are we totally screwed? <laughs> because if Beowulf doesn't come back, what would that mean? What possibly could it mean? Say that again? Well, they're pretty sure Grendel was dead because they followed the trail of gore. But, Mama was still alive. So they come to the hall. The Lord of those men, mighty in the throng, he trod the meat hall plain. Then the ruler of thanes entered there, daring in actions, honored in fame. We're talking about Beowulf. Battle brave hero to greet Hrothgar. And what do they do? They get to the entrance of Herod, and they set the head down on the ground. And they grab it by the hair, and then they start walking into the hall. Now what's going to happen? You set the head down so that the stump of the neck is on the ground, and then you start across the hall. And you get this trail of blech, you know, all along the floor. Well, what are the Danes doing? They're eating and drinking. Okay, they think Beowulf has died. Oh, poor Beowulf. Let's party, you know. Across the hall floor. They dragged by its hair, Grindel's head across the hall floor. A grisly spectacle for the men and the queen. Everyone stared at that amazing sight. And Beowulf speaks. Look, <coughs> son of half Dane. In other words, See what I've done. Prince of the Shieldings, we have brought you gladly these gifts from the sea, which you gaze on here, token of glory. Not easily did I escape with my life, that undersea battle. Did my brave deed with difficulty. Indeed, the battle would have been over at once if God had not guarded me. Beowulf repeatedly attributes his success not to his own strength. He attributes it to God. Right? He says, nor could I achieve anything at that battle with hunting. Your little sword, Edge uh, Unferth, didn't do me any good. Though the weapon's good, I'm not saying anything about the weapon. No. But the ruler of man granted to me that I might see in the wall a gigantic old sword hanging, glittering. We don't know if it's hanging in that, you know, in Grindel and Mrs. Grindle's, you know, living room. <laughs> they have decorations on the wall, and they have this nice big old sword, like it's a family heirloom. After all, they are descended from whom? Cain. Cain. What else is descended from Cain? What is this? Who made the sword, according to the poem? Giants. giants. And the giants are descended from Cain. So it's like, well, this is an old family heirloom, like the sword that Hrothgar gave to Beowulf, okay? That sword belonged to his father, okay? The sword that Unferth gives to Beowulf to fight Grindel's mother belonged to his father, we were told. So the sword in the cave is like a family heirloom. It just happens to be a cursed family heirloom, probably. Yeah? Yeah, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. 
Just, yeah, it's just what I'm getting to. Because notice what he says. He says, I saw this sword, what? Hanging on the wall. Well, if we go back to the Siegemann passage, what happens when Siegemann kills the dragon? The sword sticks in the wall. So, sticks in the wall, hanging on the wall. Are they different? Not necessarily. I mean, yes, literally. But if something is sticking in the wall, it's hanging out of it. <coughs> so what does he do? He goes up, whips the sword, and probably in the same motion that he grabs the sword, he just swings and kills Grindel's mother. So he says, I found a gigantic old sword. He, the ruler of men, has always guided the friendless one. Well, who's the friendless one? Beowulf here. But what else does that mean? The exile. Okay. So I drew that weapon, and in that conflict, when I had the chance, I slew, slew the shepherds of that house. Then that battle sword burned up with its ornaments. As the blood shot out, hottest battle sweat, I brought the hilt back from the enemy. I avenged the old deeds, the slaughter of Danes, as seemed only right. Now you have my word, what? You can sleep without care. And he kind of implies, and it's kind of implied earlier when it says, you know, he saw all kinds of treasure, but he didn't take any. Then he went through the passages of this underground hall that belonged to Grindel and his mother and made sure there weren't any other, you know, little Grindelkin sleeping or hatching or, you know, think aliens, you know. There weren't going to be any more coming around to bother him. So he says, Now you have my word that you may inherit, sleep without care with your company of men, and everything young and old in your nation. You need fear nothing, prince of the shieldings from that side, as you did before. What you Danes couldn't do, I, agate, have done, essentially. And so he hands the golden sword hilt to Hrothgar. He placed it in the hand of the gray-haired war chief, the wise old leader, that old work of giants. That old work of giants goes back and is restating the golden hilt. It came to the keeping of the Danish lord after the fall of demons, a work of wondersmiths. And when that evil-hearted man, God's adversary, gave up the world. Well, who was the evil-hearted man? Notice, not demon, not Grim guest, not heathen, not monster, not fiend, man. Okay. He's talking about Grindel. When he died, God's adversary, guilty of murders, and his mother too. All right. The implication that the poet is trying to get across is Grindel and his mother are human. Okay. They are human. Are they misshapen? Yeah. <laughs> Are they different? Definitely. And it passed to the possession of the world kings between the two seas of all those that dealt out treasures in Danish lands. So Hrothgar gets this sword in his hand, and we're told, Hrothgar spoke. Now usually when we read in the poem, so-and-so spoke, they speak immediately. Beowulf Mavaloda, that is, speech. And Beowulf speaks. Here, we're told, Hrothgar speaks. And then we get about 11 lines of not <laughs> 11 lines of description. He studied the hilt of the old heirloom, where was written the origin of ancient strife. Okay. And the word in the Old English isn't written. It's carved or inscribed. So on this sword hilt is inscribed some kind of story. When the flu Russian seized the race of giants, they suffered awfully. That was a people alien to the eternal Lord. The last reward the ruler gave them through the raging waters. Now, almost everyone takes this little passage to be referring to the flood of Noah. The race of giants that are slain are the Nephilim. 
from the book of Genesis. Okay? The offspring of the sons of God who went into the daughters of men. Well, who were the sons of God? Angelic beings. Do, 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 do. You know, we're off in the twilight zone here. Okay? Who were referred to, described as giants among men. Okay? Some say, however, that it doesn't have to be referring to the Noahic flood. But that it could be referring to the pagan Germanic mythology, where you also have a giant flood, as we do in all mythologies of the world. Okay? But, you know, the eternal lord, the ruler of all, that kind of does away with the Germanic idea. So what else? He sees marked in bright rune letters. For whom that sword, the best of irons, had first been made, with scrollery and serpentine patterns. And this is something that bugs the bejeebies out of Baal. If only the poet had said who it was made for. If only the text said something like, uh, <coughs> for my purposes, um, trying to remember the old English. Something. Sigmund Wert Mitch. Sigmund made me. Okay. And we have swords that survive from Anglo Saxon England. Things like this on them. So and so made me, or so and so had me made. Today, what would it say? Made in China. <laughs> Today, it would say, China, <laughs> worked, Mitch. Okay? So he reads in runic letters whose sword it is. And then he speaks. And he gives a long speech. Okay? And the speech lasts from 1700 to 1780, 1, 2, 3, to 1784. Okay? It's an 84-line speech that is almost always called Rothgar's homily or sermon. Because there's no other way to read this other than it's a sermon. Well, what's the purpose of a sermon? If you go to church and you have a preacher who stands up and preaches, what does the sermon preach? Sometimes it might be about Jesus or the deeds of Jesus, that kind of thing. What else, though? How to be a good person. What to do in certain situations. Well, this is the kind of homily that Hrothgar is going to give. And so he says, One may indeed say, if he acts in truth and right for the people, remembers all, the old guardian of his homeland, that is, everything after the say, all goes back to the one. It all restates that one. Okay, That is, if somebody acts in truth, and he acts rightly for the people, and he remembers all, all, and he is the old guardian of his own land, then he can rightly say that this earl, and he's speaking to Beowulf, was born a better man. Well, what kind of word is better? Okay, what does it mean? What are the three forms that better is one of? Good. Better, best. Why doesn't he say the person who rules the land who knows everything can truly say it's a good man? He doesn't say that. He says this earl is a better man. What does he say? Is there someone out there better? He's not saying that there's not a better. Better implies what? Better than okay. 
So if I were to just come in here, you know, talk about students in general, talk about the students in this class, and they say, but Brian's a better student. What does that mean about the rest of you? <laughs> you don't quite cut it. You're not quite as good. So he says, this earl was what? Born a better man. He doesn't say this earl is. From his birth, he is better. In other words, there's something different about Beowulf. All right? My friend Beowulf, your glory is exalted throughout the world. Really? How do we know this? Well, what does Hrothgar say when Beowulf first arrives? Stories about him. How he has the strength of 30 men in each hand grasp. All right? So, your glory is exalted throughout the world. Every people. You hold it all with patient care and temper strength with wisdom. Strength. Latin, fortitudo, with wisdom, et and wisdom, strength, and wisdom. Okay. Hey, uh, oh, which one was it? A scholar in the back, back in the sixties. It's either John Lyerly or Robert Caskey wrote an essay called um, Fortitudo et Sapientiae, the controlling theme in Beowulf, that these two ideas, fortitude and wisdom, strength and wisdom, are the controlling theme. Because what do we see? Well, when you open the poem, you see Hrothgar. And early in life, he's what? Really strong. Okay. And then what happens? He gets old. He loses his strength. But as he gets old, wisdom. So by the time Beowulf enters the poem, Hrothgar has wisdom, but he doesn't have any strength. Well, at the beginning of the poem, you have Schild. Schild has great strength. Maybe not necessarily a lot of wisdom. We meet Beowulf's uncle, Helok. No wisdom at all. His very name. Hilak or Hidralak, as some people pronounce it, can mean thought. Dummy, in other words. Okay? Just one second, Brian. So what does Hrothgar just said about You're the whole package, man. You've got it both. You've got it. wisdom and strength. It's either... Robert Caskey or John Lyerly. I'm pretty sure it's Caskey. So he says, you hold it all with what? With patient care. Patient. Okay. And you temper strength with wisdom. Notice it's not just that you have strength and wisdom. He tempers strength. Well, what do you do when you temper something? When you temper steel, you make it stronger. So he tempers his strength. He alloys his strength with his wisdom. To you I shall fulfill our friendship as we've said. In other words, you're going to get a lot of treasure. You shall become a comfort everlasting to your own people. Mm, not quite. There'll be a comfort, yes, for a long time, but not everlastingly. Not so was Haramode. We've heard Haramode before, right? Right after Beowulf kills Grindel, they're making their way back following the path of Grindel, and the old Shope starts to weave new songs together. And he praises Beowulf by comparing him with Sigamund. And then he goes on with this little comparison about how horrible Aramod was. And that his own people betrayed him because he wasn't generous. 
Not so was Harold. of Edgewater, the honor shieldings. He grew not for their delight, but for their destruction and the murder of Danish men. What did he do? Enraged, he cut down his table companions, comrades in arms. He killed his own men in the hall. And he turned away alone from the pleasures of man, that famous prince. Though mighty God exalted him in the joys of strength and force. Which God gave him great strength and force. He advanced him far over all men. Yet in his heart he nursed a blood ravenous <clears throat> breast horse. In other words, man, he loved to kill. No rings did he give to the Danes for their honor. He did distribute treasure. We're going to find out in a few moments why treasure exists. It exists for one reason. And by treasure, all I mean is wealth. Money, gold, jewels, gems, silver, etc. Right? So they were joyless to suffer the pains of that strife, a long-lasting harm to his people. Notice, Beowulf will be an everlasting comfort to his people, but here is a long-lasting harm to his Learn from him. Beowulf has just come back from killing the second of two. And here he gets this old guy telling him, learn virtue. Okay? Understand virtue. For your sake I have told this in the wisdom of my winters. For your sake. In other words, I'm not saying this for myself. I'm not saying it for my children, Hrethric, or my nephew, Hrothulf. Or my wife, Welthau, or my dirty, rotten, blood, uh, brother-killing Thane, Unferth. It's for you. And what does it come from? The wisdom of his winters. In other words, I've lived a long time. Time for me to teach you what I've learned. It is a wonder to say, Almighty God, in his great spirit, allots wisdom, land, to mankind. He has control of everything. Okay? He has control of everything. What does that mean? He has control of Great. He has control of Grindel's mother. He has control, taken all the way back, of Cain. God isn't surprised by any actions, in other words. At times... He permits the thoughts of a man in a mighty race to move in delights. Gives him to hold in his homeland the sweet joys of earth, the stronghold of men. Grants him such power over his portion of the world, a great kingdom that he himself cannot imagine, and end to it in his folly. So, at times, God allows someone to rise up and become a great king and to expand his kingdom and to be well loved by his people. And to pretty much be king of the hill. So that this person does what? He cannot imagine an end to his time. Well, generally, where are you in life when you develop, if you do, that kind of mentality? How are things going for you? Pretty good. You are, to use an image from later medieval literature, you are at the top up here of fortune's wheel. And fortune is always changing, right? That's why we call things fortunate and, oh, that's unfortunate. What does it mean to be unfortunate? It means you're screwed. <laughs> it means fortune's wheel has turned from up here where you are Bill Gates, or Warren Buffett, it'd be like suddenly tomorrow, you know, Berkshire Hathaway being worth zip. Okay, Warren Buffett's company. Okay. Or somebody hacking into all of Bill Gates' financial accounts. And he wakes up in the morning and he finds out he's penniless. And not even his foundation has any money anymore. Okay. That would be fortune continually turning. So, he describes the person who has this kind of attitude 
as what? Folly in his foolishness. That's what folly means. Why? Because he cannot imagine an end to it. He thinks because he's reached, he's come from down here, up here, okay, that now everything's going to go along on this level. Nothing's going to change. Everything is perfect. He dwells in plenty. In no way plague him illness or old age, nor do evil thoughts darken his spirit. I mean, what's the phrase? The world is his oyster. He's just got everything he can want. Nor any strife or sword hate shows itself, but all the world turns to his will. He knows nothing worse. Everything's going perfectly. At last, his portion of pride within him grows and flourishes. His portion of pride doesn't mean this, that this individual is an exceptionally proud, arrogant, hubristic person. No, it just means all of us have a portion of pride. Things we take pride in. You do well on a paper. That's a good reason to pat yourself on the back. Okay? But his pride does what? It grows and flourishes. It becomes a little more than it ought to be. While the guardian sleeps, the soul's shepherd. Well, what's the guardian of the soul? What's the shepherd of the soul that guards against pride? Your conscience. The conscience sleeps, and that sleep is too sound. Bound with cares, the slayer too close, who sinful and wicked shoots from his bow. Okay, Your gloss tell you the slayer is sin or vice. The soul's guardian is reason, conscience, or prudence. Well, the only problem with that is reason, conscience, and prudence are three separate things. They're not synonymous. Okay? And when he says, then he is struck in his heart under his helmet with a bitter dart. Okay? The word there that is translated bitter can also mean flaming. And the word that's, that gets translated dart can also mean arrow. This may be, some of us think at least, this may be the only close scriptural allusion to the New Testament, to the book of Ephesians, where St. Paul warns against the flaming arrows of Satan. Therefore, you put on the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness to do what? To repel those. Well, what's going to happen here? What? How do these dark They go under the protection. Okay? He is struck in his heart under his helmet. It's not his helmet. Where do most people wear a helmet? On their head. Okay? The old English is under his helm, which means like mail coat. That can be a helm. The thing you put on your head can be a helm. What happens? He knows no defense. Doesn't he know any defense? He's had things going swimmingly well for him. Why else? The conscience is asleep. If the conscience is asleep, if one cannot determine right from wrong, you combat whatever it is that's offered to you. And the language here is kind of of an offering, of a temptation. If the conscience is asleep, how does temptation appear? Well, that sounds good. <laughs> Go for it. Let's do it. He knows no defense, the strange, dark demands of evil spirits. What he has long held seems too little. So, he's long held 
this territory, it's no longer Fortune Wheel, now it's territory. And now what does he want? More. More. <laughs> More. 42 billion, you know, let's use Bill Gates. 42 billion isn't enough. I want 43 billion. 43 billion isn't enough. I want more. Back earlier. Shield plant isn't enough. I need more. Well, let's take the meat hall benches from the other tribe. No, no, it's not enough. More. Keep expanding outward. What he has long held seems angry and greedy. He gives no golden rings for vaunting boasts. That is, he doesn't distribute treasure to those who make vaunting boasts. No, in his final destiny, he neglects and forgets. Since God, ruler of glories, gives him a portion of honors. Notice he hasn't been given all honors. You know, it's like God raises him up and says, you know, it's pretty good. Pat yourself on the back, and what does he take? He takes a pat on the back to being universal applause. He now thinks he is the end all and be all of kingship. But he doesn't remember God. In the end, it finally comes about that the lone life dwelling starts to decay and falls, fated to die. Why fated to die? Because God has so laid the path that a Grindel will show up, possibly. But what else does it mean? Yeah, what are the two constants in life? Taxes. In death, okay, everybody dies. Period. So the loaned life dwelling starts to decay. Notice this person is struck down in the prime of life. No, he gets to live a long time. So he does start to get old. His teeth fall out, loses the strength of his arms, and another follows him who doles out his riches without it. So the old man, who's hoarded all the riches, built up a great treasure chest, dies, and another follows him, and if we take Anglo-Saxon and Germanic practice to be the norm, that other is his son. And what does he do? He opens the treasure chest and says, come and get it. He doles it out, we're told, without regret. He doesn't hold anything back. The Earl's ancient treasure. He has no terror. Defend yourself from this wickedness, or from wickedness, dear Beowulf, best of men, and choose the better. Choose, there's that word again, better. Well, what's the better? Eternal counsel. What does he mean, choose eternal counsel? He means... Choose that counsel which is best for each. Care not for pride, great champion. He killed Grindel's mother the day before he killed Grindel. Then he's saying, Beowulf, don't pat yourself on the back. Don't be proud. Choose eternal counsel. In other words, remember God. The glory of your might is but a while. Well, what is the glory of his might? He has the strength of 30 men in each hand. That's something to be proud of. Okay? But he says, it won't last long. Soon it will be that sickness or the sword will shatter your strength. Soon, like clock's ticking. You're going to wake up tomorrow, Bailiff, and you're going to go, oh. I'm sore. I can't move. Oh, I need to see a chiropractor because I can't get my shoulder down, you know. Or the sword, or the grip of fire, or the surging flood, or the cut of a sword, or the flight of a spear, or terrible old age. Notice all these wonderful images of how death can arrive. One or another of these, Beowulf, will come, or the light of your eyes will fail and flicker out. You'll live so long that you get cataracts 
and you won't be able to see. And the light of your eyes will fail and flicker out. That's death. Keep hold that thought. In one fell swoop, death, O oh warrior, will overwhelm you. Okay. This is this is you know this should be Beowulf's victory lap. This should be when the reporter sticks in his face and says, Beowulf, you just conquered the known world. Now what are you gonna do? I'm going to Disney World. Okay? No. Hrothgar wants him to say, I'm gonna die. Because everybody dies. I'm going to remember my death. What Hrothgar doing here is he is delivering a memento mori. Reminder of death. You know? <clears throat> He's reminding them. Everything's going great for you now, but you will die. Yes? But didn't Beowulf, when he spoke, he said, if it wasn't for God, so I'm just confused as to why he's like going off on me. Could, well, because he's an old man. Is it because he didn't do it himself? Or? Well, hold, hold that thought. We're going to get to that real quickly. Because okay. <clears throat> it is true. Beowulf said, you know, unless God had helped me, I never would have been able to do this. And that, I think, is the tempering strength with wisdom. Beowulf doesn't ascribe his victories only to his strength. He always says, God help me. If God hadn't been for me, etc. Okay? So, death will come. What's the very next word? Thus. What does thus mean? What's another word for thus? Therefore, in conclusion, okay, therefore and thus mean I am <laughs> that person. Therefore, or thus, hundred half years, I held the ring dates under the skies and kept them safe from war from many tribes throughout this Middle Earth, from spears and swords, none under the expanse of heaven, my enemy. Um, line 1828. At times he permits the thoughts of a man and a mighty race to move into lights, gives him to hold in his homeland. The sweet joys of earth, a stronghold of men, grants him such power over his portion of the world, a great kingdom that he cannot himself see, imagine it into it. In no way plague him illness or old age, nor do evil in his spirit, nor any strife of sword hate. Okay? And then Hrothgar says, Thus, for 50 years did rule. What does thus mean? Like the story I just told you. I think, and I'm pretty alone in this, Hrothgar is saying, I am the man I just described. I thought I had everything going well. Yeah. Look, turnabout came in my own homeland. He, he thought everything was great. And then turnabout, reversal came. He went from up here on Fortune's Wheel to down here. After gladness, when Grendel became my invader, ancient adversary. For that persecution, I bore perpetually the greatest heart cares. Thanks be to the Creator, eternal Lord, that I have lived long enough <coughs> to see stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. And I think what Hrothgar is saying is, I was filled with pride. I thought that everything I had, I earned. I deserved. Everything I had, I had on the strength of my own power. I forgot. And what happened? <laughs> Grendel comes a-knocking. So why does Grendel come a-knocking? We're told he goes 
era bound. God's ire or anger he bore. Remember I talked about that earlier, how that can have two meanings. It means he could have born within his own body, within his own soul. God's anger. God was angry at Grindel. Or it can mean that he bore God's anger at himself and carried God's anger against the Danes. In other words, that he was a tool. The Danes a lesson. You, I exist. Don't forget me. You think you're almighty and all powerful. Hello, meet Grindel. He's going to teach you a few lessons. So, I give thanks to God that I've lived long enough to see that head stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. Why? Because for the last however many years, what did he not expect to see? Any change. Because he was down here. And if you've ever been in the black pit of depression, I mean real depression, not just, oh, my boyfriend or girlfriend left me, boo-hoo, the world sucks. I mean, you know, stupid things, okay? What do you tend to think? There is no hope. There's no way out. That's where he was. So when the poet, back at line 175 and following, says, those who can expect change for the better, what must they do? They throw themselves into the embrace of the fire. Because they But then he says, but those who can seek a change after their death day, who have something better, they're welcoming into the Father's embrace. Okay? Go to your seat, Beowulf, and join in battle. Between us shall be shared a great many treasures. So he finishes his homily. What has he told Beowulf? You're great. You're wonderful. You killed the monsters. And then like Han Solo to Luke Skywalker, hockey kid. In other words, those are just two monsters. Where are those monsters? Out there. What about the monsters inside? Beware the monsters inside. Right? So Beowulf goes, takes his seat. The feast is prepared. The hall is prepared. The dark helm of night comes. And notice they're not worried. Nobody runs. There's great noise. There's great singing and revelry. Okay? Um, let's see here. We're going to skip a bunch. Fit 26. Beowulf tells Hrothgar, we want to go home. <laughs> now we see fairs come from far. I wish to say that we desire to see. Here we were honorably entertained with delight. You treated us well. He says, if there's ever anything I can do to earn more of your affection than the battle leads I've done already, rule once. Pick up the phone and give me a call. If ever I hear over the sea's expanse that your neighbors threaten you with terror, thank you, <laughs> as you're able to do, I will come, he says, with a thousand things. And I think this is probably a not so subtle comment to Hravel. Don't pick on your cousins. Be nice to them. Okay? And he says, I'll come with a thousand things. He like will support. If ever Hrethric decides, son of a prince, to come to the Gatish court, he will find many friends there. Far off lands are better sought by one who is himself good. And Hrothgar says, thank you, God gave you these words. The wise look at those words into your heart. God told you to say that so that you would make me feel at ease. I have never heard a shrewder speech from such a young man. You are strong in might and sound in mind. Here it is again. Strong in might and sound in mind. Prudent in speech. 
I expect it is likely that if it should ever happen that the spear of the horrors of war take Rethel's as he elect, then the people will elect you king. Okay? Your character, skipping a bit, your character pleases me better and better, beloved Baal. About what? That between our peoples, the Gaitish nation and the spear Danes, that there shall be peace and strife shall rest. So when Beowulf and his men land on the coast, and the coast guard says, who are you? And what are you doing? And Beowulf says, oh, we come from Helak. not meant to be a comforting sign. Because there's been tension. There's been conflict between the Danes and the Gates. And what Hrothgar says is, just brought peace. Real peace between us. The malicious deeds that they endured before the Danes and the Gates. As long as I shall rule this wide realm and treasures together. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what does he do? He then gives more treasure to Beowulf. Right? And he tells Beowulf, go seek out your own king. And we're going to skip a bunch. They get on their ship. Notice, all of Beowulf's men get treasure. Beowulf gives his sword to the coast guard. Okay, as a sign of thanks for watching over their ship and such. And they make their way back to the land of the gates. Okay. And they go in and they see Hig, the wife of Helak, lying 1926. And then we get this long about Hig and what kind of woman she was before she met Helak. Okay. And we're not going to talk about that. I want to pick up with 28, fit 28. The hardy males with this hand-picked troop went across the sand, trod the sea plain, the wide shore. The world's candle, that is the sun, shone hastening from the sea, survived their journey, and they went boldly to where they knew the protector of earls, the slayer of Anyanthal, good young battle king, gave out rings. I need to put up yet another genealogy. The poet of Beowulf loves genealogies because he riddles the poem with them. Weeds. You have Onion Thal, who has two children. Ultra and Onoma. Ultra has two children, Eanmund and Eadils. He doesn't have any, as far as we know. Okay. Onola is married, remember, to the daughter of half Hrothgar's sister. Ultra, we have no idea who he's married to. So, the man who killed Onal, back over here, uh, these are the gates. Okay, we have Hrethel, Haribald, Hathkin, Helok, Daughter, question mark, who marries? And they produce male. Okay? So, Helak over here, he's the one who comes over here and he X's out onion theory. We're going to get into this really much more than you ever want to know in a few minutes, if we have time to say. Okay? And what did he do? He gave out rings in his fortress. To heal like the rival of Beowulf was kicked quickly. And Beowulf comes in. He starts passing around the meat cups, the, the drinks. And he like a Beowulf. I want to get up to like 2600 today. I don't know if we're going to make it. How did you fare, beloved Beowulf, in your journey when you suddenly resolved to seek a fire of strife of the salt sea, a battle in Herod? Did you better at all the well-known woe of Hrothgar? For that I see heart care and distress. 
mistrusted the adventure of my beloved man. Well, what did Beowulf tell us earlier? Was he, encouraged to go? he says, everybody encouraged me to go. And now the king, his uncle, says, oh, I was just so worried about you. I implored that you not seek that slaughter spirit at all. Okay, what does implore mean? I implore you to study well. Does that mean I'm just telling you, you know, do your best? No. I beg you, knees. Say, well, please don't go. No. Let the South Danes themselves make war against Grendel. I mean, if they're supposed to be all mighty, the victory shieldings, the spear shieldings, the killer shieldings, let them do spearing and killing. I say thanks to God that I might see you again safe and sound. What does he mean there by that? It means I didn't expect to see you safe and sound. Thanks be to God that you're alive still. And Baal says, well, it's no mystery. People have heard already. He says, I avenged all the deaths of the Shieldings. And he talks about when he met Hrothgar, and he told Hrothgar of his intentions, and he says, the troop was in delight, they all loved me. And he says, the they all came and distributed, you know, drinks and stuff. And then he tells us something we did not see before. He mentions Hrothgar's daughter. Just go ahead and throw up another genealogy. Okay. Uh, Swedes, Dates, Danes. Let's start back at the beginning. Uh, half Dane. So you have Half Dane, Haragar, Halga, Hrothgar, who marries Onola. Hrothgar has children, Hrethric, Rothmund, And Freyru. Now, remember the other day when I talked about, you know, names alliterate? Not all the time with daughters, however. Okay? Part of that is because kingship and all that kind of stuff is passed down father to son. So they don't really count. So my, my eldest son, who is my second child, loves to... My eldest child, my first daughter... Uh, Crazy by saying, you know, I'm the heir. I'm going to get him. She's like, Nathaniel, you're not the heir. You're the heir, but you're not the heir. <laughs> kind of a thing. Okay? So, Beowulf says, Hrothgar's daughter, Freywaru, was promised young gold adorned to the gracious son of Froda, that is, Ingil. And he tells us a story. This does not show up anywhere else in Beowulf. This story, however, does show up in other Germanic literature. So we need to tell the story. And Beowulf, turns out, is a pretty good storyteller. He says, here's what I think is going to happen. Because why is Freyru being given in marriage to Ingel? Marries Ingel, son of, not Frodo. <laughs> Frodo. Okay. Why is she married to Ingel? Because the Danes and the Heathenbards are at war. We saw how well that worked out for Hildebur, right? In the Finsburg episode, she was given in marriage to F And it pretty much did not end up pretty. Beowulf's going to suggest the same thing's going to happen here. Because what's going to happen? She's going to go off to Ingeld's home. She's going to bring her retainers with her. She gets her own little coterie of troops, as it were. And her retainers going to be some young stud, some guy who's just high on himself. And he's going to be walking around in the hall, in whose hall? The Heathelbard's hall. And he's going to be wearing armor and a sword that were given to him by his father. But his father got killing the Heathelbard warrior. 
Okay? And there's going to be the son of that heathen barb warrior sitting in the hall. And there's also going to be sitting next to that son of the heathen barb warrior, an old, gray, grizzled veteran who's going to say, Do you look at that? That dirty, rotten SOB Dane is wearing your daddy's armor. You know where he got it? His daddy killed your daddy. You going to take that? He's doing that on purpose. He's rubbing your face in. Get him. And what's going to happen? Strife will be renewed. Okay, what kind of strife? Well, now it's within a family. You ever see how this feud idea always, it keeps coming back to being familial? Okay, like La Familia, <laughs> Cosa Nostra. So, he says, in that deadly, fit 29, in that deadly shield play, they undid their beloved comrades in their own lives. Then an old spear bearer speaks, I love this line, it's just so beautiful, over his beer. He's had a bit too much. And he says, can you, my friend, recognize that sword which your father bore? Blah, 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 blah. And he urges and reminds him, and strife is renewed, etc. And so he finishes that, and he says, I don't think this alliance is going to work. So let me tell you more about Grendel. And he tells him about the battle with Grendel. Um, and how he killed Grendel. We're going to skip a bunch. And how Hrothgar gave him treasure. He talks about Grendel's mother. Killing Grendel's mother. He talks about Ashra's death. Um, and fit 31. He says, so what did Hrothgar do? He followed good, good customs. He gave more treasure. The prize for my strength. And so what does, what does Beowulf do? The treasure that Hrothgar gave him, he gives to Hela. Why? Well, just like in a modern corporation, if you do something well, if you're not at the top of the food chain, and you do something really well, who also gets the credit or the glory? The person you answer to. What's the flip side of that? If you do something really poorly, that also reflects on your Lord, your boss. Okay? So, Beowulf um, talks about treasure and such. He brings in the heirloom of Hrethel. Adorned with gold, line 2190 and such. That's the sword and, and such. And then we're told, line 2200. Let me back up just a little bit. 2190. He brings in that treasure of, er, of Hrethel and lays it on Helak's lap. Excuse me. Um, Helak brings in Hrethel's treasure, lays it in Beowulf's lap. This is his honoring of Beowulf. And then we're told... Both of them had inherited land in the nation, a home and native rights, but the wider rule was reserved to the one who was... That is, they are both in line to the kingship, okay? But Helak gets more land and the kingship because he's more direct in line. Kingship goes like this to this. Well, if Helak dies, Beowulf is in line if... if Beowulf can find a way to get rid of Hargrim. What happens? They came to pass amid the crash of battle, like 2200, in later days, after he like lay dead, and for Hargrim, the swords of battle held deadly slaughter, blah, 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 that the kingdom falls into Beowulf's hands. And he held it well for 50 winners. Notice that. From like 2200 to 2209, 50 years go by. In nine lines. So what's going on here? Well, Kevin Kiernan, scholar I've mentioned before, kind of thinks this is the poet taking two totally separate stories and joining them together. One story is about Beowulf and his fight with Grendel and Grendel's mother. 
The other story is about Beowulf as an old man fighting a dragon. There's a way to join the two. And so he takes nine lines to do that. Okay. So what happens? Beowulf's king for 50 years. Wise king, old guardian of his homeland. Until a dragon comes. What happens? Some stupid guy goes and robs the dragon's horde. If there's anything you love dragons, you never steal from a dragon. Because a dragon is like a mafia accountant. And what I mean by that is, he knows every little piece of treasure in his hoard. And the mafia part is, you steal a piece, and the dragon's going to come out very, very angry. And he's not just going to go steal a piece of yours. He's going to do like in uh, the Untouchables, you know. You touch one of ours, okay? So what does he do? He comes out of his dragon horde, out of the mountain, as it were, and just lays waste to the entire country. Right? And we're going to stop here. Stop with line about 2230. Because we have to slow down because I need to talk give some a good bit of time to this little passage called the lay of the last survivor hopefully we'll be able to finish everything on Tuesday